Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, welcome. We are so excited to have you all here today with us and that you chose to spend the day with us. We have a really great program planned for you. Um, I'm Dina Ladd. I'm the Executive Director for Missouri Cures, and I'm not sure that all of you are familiar with our organization. Uh, we are a statewide organization, and we promote and also protect all medical research taking place in Missouri. Uh, we have a great website, missouricures.org. We have, we keep stories updated on the website about all of the medical advances taking place in the state. And we also have clinical trial information, so visit our website. And we also keep um, events that we're doing around the state. So. Last year was our first WISE conference. How many of you came to that last year? Oh, wonderful. Oh, this is great. So um, this year is our second annual conference. Um, and we actually expanded around the state. We were asked to take WISE kind of on the road. So we had a WISE breakfast in Columbia and Springfield. And then November 13th, we are having our first uh, WISE conference in Kansas City. So it's, it's just been a really great experience and um, I hope you all make new friends today and you network and you gather some new business cards. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to introduce Margaret Tollerton. Oh, there she's playing in the back. So Margaret and I make up Missouri Cures. We're, we're the Missouri Cures team. And uh, yay, Margaret. <laughs> and Margaret is our outreach director. She lives in Columbia, and then I'm based here in St. Louis. But Margaret travels around the state, going to a lot of small towns, and really talking about the importance of medical research. So she's great. Wanted to introduce her. Um, I have to thank, of course, our sponsors who are up here on the screen, and most of them have tables out in the lower atrium. I mean, without our sponsors, we, we could not have had this conference. So these are organizations and companies who support women in science and female entrepreneurs. So when you're out looking at the tables, uh, say thank you, and um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to have so many great sponsors for the conference. I'd like to also thank the organizing committee, which is listed on the back of your program. We have a lot of fun doing planning this event. Um, folks from Washington University and SLU and MoBio, BioSTL, AMSO, University of Missouri, but in Danforth Center. Um, so we get together about every month, have a lot of fun, and uh, we and we plan the conference. So thanks to the to the organizing committee. For those of you that might want to tweet today, the tweeters, um, please use hashtag wise15stl. So it's hashtag wise15stl. Um, um, we also have some special guests with us, some elected officials um, here today, this morning. We really appreciate you stopping by. We have State Senator Scott Sifton, who's right over here. <laughs> um, County Assessor Jake Zimmerman, he's back there. Um, and I'm, I hope I don't say this name wrong. We have, um, I gotta put on my glasses here so I can see, Vinky Palamon, who is the president of the Melville School Board. He's here with us. <laughs> Isn't it great? All these men, they all came, <laughs> it's great. Um, and then we also have State, Re State Representative Tracy McQuarrie is on her way, but she'll be spending the day with us. So we really appreciate their support and their show and, and support for medical research. So thanks to all of you. Um, and the last thing is just the housekeeping issues, where the restrooms are located, which is always really important. <laughs> so. There is, there are restrooms on the lower atrium. There are also restrooms on the level that you came in, back in the far corner. 
So after lunch, there's a restroom right there, and there's also a restroom on the second level. So I know last year the restroom kind of got backed up a little, and so there are restrooms on all the different floors. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so now it is my absolute pleasure. I am so thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Doris Taylor. She is the Director of Regenerative Medicine Research and the Center for Cell and Organ Biotechnology at the Texas Heart Institute. She also serves as an adjunct professor for the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Texas A&M and the Department of Biosciences at Rice University. She has an amazing bio, and it's all listed in the program, but let me just highlight a few items in the bio. She is globally recognized, a recognized researcher credited with a number of important scientific breakthroughs related to cell therapy, stem cell biology, and tissue engineering-based therapies. I mean, for goodness sake, she's building a human heart. Well, I mean, that is amazing. <laughs> She frequently appears as an expert on stem cell therapy and cardiac repair uh, in the media. Her work has been recognized. Uh, she's been on 60 Minutes, The Today Show, CNN, New York Times, Good Morning America, Discovery Channel, uh, Wall Street Journal, and many others which are listed in your program. I have had the absolute pleasure getting to know Dr. Taylor. Um, we both sit on the board and executive committee of the National Alliance for Regenerative Medicine out of DC. And I can tell you, not only is she brilliant, witty, and smart, she's a whole lot of fun. So, <laughs> Dr. Taylor, come on up. I was hoping she'd leave the podium high and I could stand behind it, no, hide behind it. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you all and thank you, Dina, for inviting me and Margaret, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm gonna spend a few minutes today talking about my career and, and as I do that, I'm gonna talk about science and also about being a woman in science. And in theory, if we get the slides working, we'll, this will be easy. Um, can you switch to the, there we go. So this is just my contact information, but I put this book up here. How many of you have read The Art of War? Not that many. Okay, we'll come back to that. So I, I was asked a couple years ago to give a talk to a group of women in transplantation. And it was after a survey had been done. And when that survey was done, two things became exceedingly obvious. One, that there were not a lot of suitable mentors and role models for women in transplantation and that there were a lot of lack of opportunities for women to make contact with each other. And people were beginning to be willing to say out loud that it's lonely out there, that there's not good mentoring, advocacy, or education among ourselves. And when I gave that talk, it really made me stop and think about the science I talk about, the cool things I get to do, the medicine that we talk about, but also how I got where I am. And I've been lucky enough to ask, be asked to share that with some of you all. <clears throat> I was on the faculty in cardiology at Duke. And when I was on the faculty in cardiology, we discussed the fact that there were, most of the women in cardiology ended up being echocardiographers. They started out wanting to be interventional cardiologists but they didn't end up that way. And they didn't end up that way for, we discussed it as a group and we looked at the national data and the national data are, who said the podium moved, whoa. Um, the national data are that the three M's of work life get in the way. Mentoring, we don't have good mentors. Meetings, 
that a lot of the important meetings happen where women aren't. They either happen in the bathroom, they happen at six in the morning, they happen on the golf course, they happen places where women aren't. And so one of the things I've learned over the years is if there's a meeting, you need to show up. And you need to show up even if nothing to your mind happens. Because the point of showing up is not to get through the agenda. The point of showing up is to be there, be seen, and participate in the conversation. And then there's motherhood. The fact that most meetings happen at six in the morning or six in the evening. And if you're in a two-career family, guess who usually goes home? Oh, we're so close, but I can't get this to go forward. I just love, you know, technology is a great thing. I can build a heart, but I, can't, I, I have this effect <laughs> on computers. Um, so if I tell you nothing else, if you learn nothing else today, learn to figure out who you are in your career. And I want to recommend a book. This is a fabulous book. It's called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office 101. And it's... <laughs> and believe it or not, it's not about not being nice. It's about not being a girl. It's about how we're socialized as girls, not as women. And how we unconscious things we do that we were trained to do and it allows you to look at yourself and make decisions about how you may be interpreted in ways that you don't understand. And I'll give you an example. Most of the time when you go to a meeting, sit, look around the table. You'll see that most of the women in the room start the meeting with their hands in their lap, underneath the table, not much on the table, most of the guys have all their stuff out on the table, they're spread out, and their elbows or their arms are on the table. And the message they're giving is, I'm engaged. And the message, and, and because you're probably one of very few women in the room, the message the majority of the people in the room are reading from you is, I'm not engaged. Now, that doesn't mean you have to sit with your arms on the table. It means you get to make a decision. You get to know how somebody's going to interpret that and make a decision yourself. So read the book. It's a great book. I love the book. I've given it to most of the women in my office, in my lab, and um, I think it's phenomenal. So you've got to figure out who you are, and you've got to figure out what your passion is. And my passion is making a difference in the world. And really, it's about, I like to think about the big picture. I like to think about ideas. But then there's all this stuff about implementation and about management. And really, you have to think about all the pieces, ideas, implementation, leadership, management, teamwork, doing and supporting. But probably the best thing I've ever learned is do what you love and hire someone else to do what you don't. <laughs> I used to think it was a failure if I couldn't do it all. That if I had to hire someone to write the business plan or if I had to hire someone to do the accounting because I don't, you know, start talking about taxes and budgets and my eyes glaze over, I thought I was a failure. A coach told me, Doris, it's brilliant to hire someone to do what you hate so you can do what you do well. So my passion happens to be curing heart failure and building a heart in a lab. And I want to tell you about that. So how do you do that? Well, you have to think outside the box. And this is a postcard that I used to have on my office wall. And I gave it away. I gave it away to a woman in the UK who's a model who, if you want to look on Twitter, her name's Katie Piper. And she's a, she was a model in the UK, and she came to my lab a few years ago to understand about stem cells. And the reason she came to my lab to understand about stem cells is because 
she's an art, uh, she's a, she was a model, she was dating a guy, and she was about to do a reality TV show, and the guy she was dating hired someone to throw acid in her face. She lost the majority of her face, she lost the majority of her um, ears, her, she was burned horrifically. Imagine going from being a model where everything about yourself and your whole perception is about how you look and who you are to the, this new reality. Now the cool thing is she, and she came to my lab because she was about to have stem cells injected in her eye to try to regain the vision in her, in her eye, and they were autologous cells, and she, went down, she and the BBC came to talk about what that meant. But the cool thing about Katie is she went online after her injury and created a website called The New Beautiful. And she's joined with a number of other people to create new visions about what normal is. And it's amazing. So I gave her this postcard, and she sent me a picture recently, and it's on her living room wall. How cool is that? So I say you have to think outside the box, but really you have to forget there is a box. You have to be willing to trust your crazy ideas. You know, if somebody said to you, well, we're going to build a heart in the lab or we're going to do cell therapy to try to cure heart disease, when we came up with the idea, it was pretty radical. And I remember a New York Times reporter saying to me, okay, Doris, if it's so easy, why hasn't someone done it before? And I said, because no one thought it'd work, I guess. I don't really know. But the reality is you're full of crazy ideas. Give them a try. Maybe they'll work. And then you'll hit a home run. So let me tell you how I got involved in cell therapy and, and where we are. So a long time ago, I came to believe that cardiovascular disease is a failure of the balance between injury and repair. And that really, almost all disease is a balance between injury and repair and that aging and many chronic diseases are really a failure of stem cells. And I say that because if you think about it, for most of our lives, we have cells in our body that maintain our organs and tissues. Stem cells in virtually every organ or tissue are in our bone marrow. And injury happens, and when injury happens, inflammation occurs fall down, you scrape your knee, you get a red spot around it. That's inflammation. That's nature's cue to say, help, I've got an injury, send me cells. And if you get the right cells there, you can turn off the inflammation and heal the, as the injury heals. If you don't get the right cells there, nature ramps up the inflammation and it says, Darn it, send me cells. I need cells. And then you start recruiting the wrong cells. And you can actually feed forward the inflammatory response. So this balance of injury and repair is really what a lot of us are trying to work on. And I heard someone say a minute ago that they do genomics. And I, I view genes and epigenetics as the potential and cells as a reality, because an epigenetics are really a piece of how the reality occurs. And so I think about cell therapy as little gene factories and as little tools to really try to mediate repair and turn off inflammation. You have to do what you love, and I happen to be a person who thinks about the big picture. And so I think about ischemic heart disease from atherosclerosis, which is the early injury where just like when you fall down and scrape your knee on the inside of your blood vessels, you've got inflammation, and acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack, post-myocardial infarction, heart failure, and end-stage heart failure. Ischemic heart disease, 
and about intervening in that process, taking stem cells, usually in the face of a catastrophic injury like a heart attack, you don't have time to mobilize the cells that you need to the site of injury. The reason they tell you to get to the hospital within four hours, immediately after a heart attack, is because if you get there within four hours or you can open up the blood vessel within four hours after a heart attack occurs, you can prevent a lot of the downstream damage from the heart attack. Most men get to the hospital within four hours because their wife takes them. <laughs> Most women don't get to the hospital within four hours because they're going, well, the house is dirty, the kids got to get home from school, somebody's got to make sure everything's covered, and they do whatever and then get there late. Seriously, heart disease is the number one killer of women. Five times more women die of heart disease and die of breast cancer. It kills women every day, and it kills more women than it does men, and it kills more younger women than it does older women. So seriously learn about heart disease. But we decided a number of years ago, in the, in the late 90s, to try to intervene in the process to harvest stem cells from bone marrow or from peripheral blood and transplant them in the heart to try to actually mediate that repair early after injury. So I've been involved in, in cell therapy clinical trials for a number of years now, and there are a number of different cell types that are used, bone marrow mononuclear cells, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, I see the pointer doesn't work on up there, that's all right, endothelial progenitor cells, cardiac progenitor cells, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is there are a lot of cell types that have been used. But if you're giving your own cells, I'm going to show you some data that I hope will convince you that my cells don't look like your cells don't look like your cells. And if it's autologous cell therapy, no two patients are receiving the same drug. So we're doing all these cell therapy clinical trials, and we're basically saying, uh, we don't know what the drug is. We don't know how much we're giving. We don't know the dose. We don't know much at all. But we're looking for an effect out here. And as a result, a lot of the cell therapy trials have been moderately positive or just barely positive. So currently, right now, there are about 600 clinical trials for stem cells and heart listed at clinicaltrials.gov. About 200 of those are actively recruiting patients. First of all, 200 are actively recruiting patients. That's a lot. Second of all, that means 400 have finished or been stopped. And really, we need to try to understand what's happened. So the hurdles to cell therapy are really timing. Do you give the cells early? Do you give the cells late? Do you give the same cells early and late? Or is it about choosing the right cell at the right time for the right patient? Do we give our own cells? Do we give allogeneic cells, cells from someone else? How many cells do we need? And how do we give them? Do we give them IV? Do we give them in the heart? Do we give them in the coronary arteries? All those questions. And you know what? Those are the questions we had in 1998 when my group did the first cell therapy. And we still have those questions in part because, at least in my opinion, Cardiovascular cell therapy went from the first animal study to the first human study within a year. The reason? It was sexy, and people wanted to be first. And they did it without understanding the right cell, the right time, the right dose, the right whatever. So we're still trying to answer those questions 17 years later. There are a lot of different cells you can use, bone marrow-derived cells, mononuclear cells from the bone marrow, the stromal cells. And I want to make a point. 
you see up here MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal stromal cells, mesenchymal progenitor cells, hematopoietic stem cells, all from bone marrow. A lot of those are the same cells. Why do they have different names? Intellectual property, intellectual property, intellectual property. <laughs> Um, you can also get cells from blood, mononuclear cells, endothelial progenitor cells. You can get cells from tissues, heart, fat. Turns out fat has some of the best stem cells out there. Maybe God is a woman. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Adipose-derived stem cells, tooth pulp, virtually any tissue, liver, and more recently, amniotic fluid and as you know, umbilical cord blood. And I don't know if you know this, but umbilical cord blood has truly been a lifesaver in a number of cases because bone marrow transplants can't occur without what we call a five out of six match for, um, for tissue typing for, for individuals. And if you have cancer or you need a bone marrow transplant, if you're a minority individual or a person of color, it's very difficult to find that five out of six match because people are not in the bone, National Bone Marrow Donor Registry, hint, hint. That being said, umbilical cord blood is more forgiving. You can give, give the cells with a four out of six match. So that means a lot of individuals who otherwise would not have been able to get bone marrow transplants have been able to because of cord blood. And there are a lot of cord blood banks in the world, public as well as uh, private. If you give your cord blood to a public bank, it can be used for those purposes. So for those of you who have the question about whether or not to save your cord blood, if you're not gonna do it for yourself, have them do it for somebody else. So why is there a vari variability in at least bone marrow cell therapy? Well, because stem cell numbers are different in each patient, and because, like it or not, as we age, stem cell numbers decrease not only in number but in potency. And the stem cells decrease with chronic disease. Cells are mobilized differently in each patient, and what's really kind of ironic is when we give bone marrow cell therapy for heart disease, we take bone marrow, we get rid of the red blood cells, and we give that cell. We give that batch of cells. It's bone marrow. 95 to 98% of those cells are bone marrow cells, not stem cells. And yet we think the 3% 3 to 3 of stem cells we're giving are the ones that are having the effect. Nature's smarter than we are. And in autologous cell therapy, each patient receives a different drug. So one of the trials that I participated in was negative, meaning there were no differences between the treatment and placebo group. But I basically said, there are people who get better in clinical trials and there are people who get worse. I'm gonna take the individuals who did better who had heart failure and who got better in ejection fraction, left ventricular ejection fraction on the right here, left ventricular in systolic volume, or their oxygen consumption. And there were only 17 of those, but they got better in all three of those endpoints. That's really rigorous. That means they had to truly get better. Or who got worse? in one, two, or three of those endpoints, 61 of the patients in the trial. And I'm gonna look at their stem cells. I'm gonna look at their bone marrow cells and see if I can see anything different in the people who got better and the people who got worse. Because I had been banking these cells for the last seven years and actually examining them at the time we collected them. And what I found is that there were five or six cell types that made a difference in people who got better or didn't. But none of them were stem cells. They were B cells, T cells, the cells that you wouldn't expect, which means maybe it's really all about treating inflammation. 
Maybe it's really all about treating the injury and ramping down the inflammation. And there was one situation where the endothelial progenitor cells made a difference in the bottom graph. They were decreased in the bone marrow, the people who got better. Duh. The cells that we need to repair the vascular injury have already been sucked out of the bone marrow into the blood, potentially to the heart. Now, I can't prove that yet, but we're looking at that. The other reason that the trials are negative is because, and I'll let you read this, we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkey, and men with this condition, but medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anybody. The vast majority of cardiovascular clinical trials do not have women enrolled. 10% women, 15% women. The only times that women are really enrolled are when they're only female clinical trials, like when you're looking at estrogen or something. And there are a whole lot of reasons for that. In fact, Monday I'm going to a meeting in DC. I sit on a national policy council that's going to actually describe discuss what we need to do. Now, I told you stem cells go down with age. This is a population of stem cells that we happen to look at. And here is women, and here is men. And it's from age 18 to age 75. So stem cells go down in men, but not in women. You guys are toast. <laughs> And the reality is heart disease occurs beginning about age 40 in men as cells go down. And women catch up by about age 70, but not until the seventh decade. And if you look here, you can see a number of the cells that we looked at go down in men. They don't go down in women. And yet, the vast majority of the trials are done in men with autologous cells, and the men are on average age 65. When the cells are down, and even the cells that remain aren't functional. Duh. There may be a reason these trials, the fact that these trials are even remotely positive says that if we could do the right trial, we have a shot at a home run. I'm going to move forward now. So about close to a million people die every year from heart disease. And every day, there are about 2,600 patients sitting on the transplant list for a heart. But every year, we only transplant about 2,300 hearts. What that means is that a lot of people either get devices or don't get anything. And you can see here that the number of transplants, the number on the waiting list is going up. The number of transplants has really pretty much plateaued over the last 10 years. And the number of living donors just can't keep up with the demand. And you obviously can't have a living donor for a heart. So we said we wanted to build a heart. And I had to ask myself, OK, what, do, what, what kind of heart do I want to build? Do I just want to build one that looks like a heart? In that case, I can call a friend who's an artist or go online and find a picture. But no, I really want to build one that is a real heart. So what does that mean? I had to think about it. It has to beat, it has to pump blood, and it has to work against your blood pressure. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like a human heart. It looks just like a human heart. So how do we do that? Well, we're back to trust your crazy ideas. And this is a journal of trans American Journal of Transplantation with the picture a couple of months ago of the work underway in my lab, where we've actually taken hearts. And I'll show you. I, we started out very simply. I'm, I'm really naive. You know, I'm simple. I think about things very simply. What do you need to build a heart? You need billions of cells. Well, we got that. We got stem cells from everywhere. We need a place to put those cells, because beating heart cells in a dish is not a heart. So we need a place to put them. We need a scaffold. And we need physiology at the end of the day. So 
building an organ, I, I started out saying we need cells, we need a scaffold, we need whatever. And then we said, well, if it's easy, someone else would have done it. Oh, wait, nature did. So we took cadaveric organs and we developed a way to use soap to literally wash all the cells out of the organ. And when we do that, we were left with the extracellular matrix. It's funny, if, uh, uh, my new, <laughs> someone in my group helped me uh, generate this slide and the arrow on the far right shouldn't be there. We, uh, it implies we, we made a pancreas, I mean made a kidney out of a pancreas and that's a whole <laughs> different, that's different science. Um, but what we did is we actually developed a process where we can use the vasculature of an organ, these are all pig organs, heart, liver, pancreas, and we can remove all the cells. And you can see on the bottom the extracellular matrix scaffold that retains the shape of the organ and the, the macroscopic structure of the organ. So imagine if we had a scaffold that we could then repopulate. Again, we use detergent to wash the cells out. Kind of gives, my mom's going to wash my mouth out with soap, a whole new meaning. Um, but we, when we did this at first, we said, okay, that's really cool. It looks like a heart even at the end of the day. And you can see the blood vessels that are still present. All the chambers are still present. And Here's a video showing a human, the first human heart that we decellularized. We're putting a camera in the, video, in the heart, and you can see the inside, and it's all white. The cells are gone. This is the inside of the left ventricle. Here's a pulmonary valve, very sensitive. It's closed when we take the camera out, and the cells are gone. So you can see here, um, that we actually have the blood vessels that are retained and we're infusing blood into this heart, this human heart, and the blood stays in the vessels. And you can see on the far left where we've, where we've kind of changed the contrast a little bit to highlight the vessels. The middle is a human heart and the right is an image of OCT going down the left, descending, left anterior descending coronary artery, and you see the inside of the artery is intact in this heart. In fact, one of the cardiologists I work with said, that's one of the best looking arteries I've ever seen. Maybe we ought to use soap on people all the time. <laughs> um, so you can see that we were able to remove all the cells, but we leave the vasculature intact. And in fact, we can take labeled cells and put them back in and rebuild vessels throughout the heart. So you can see a, this is a rat heart, so the size of a half dollar on the, on the two images on the left, cells we put in the arteries and the veins, green and red. And then on the right-hand side, you see one of the vessels and branches of the vessels. The blue is nuclei of cells and the combined color is the cells that have moved in from both the arteries and the veins. So can we put it all together to make a human heart? Well, we took a human heart and you can see the muscularized region on the top and we decellularized it. The first point I'll make is look at all the fat on the surface of the human heart and that's a whole different issue. But we, we washed out all the color, all the red, all the cells, and it's absolutely naked. And what we've done, we started with the small heart, is we decellularized, we put cells back in, and on the bottom right, you can see a heart after we put cells back in eight days later, beating again. So pretty cool to be able to go, and, and when we first did it, the reviewers, don't get me started. The reviewer said, oh, well, if, you, if it's beating again, you obviously didn't wash all the cells out in the first place. And I said, okay, but if we took a heart and we exposed it to soap and we kept it alive and beating in the lab for eight days, that's worth publishing anyway. <laughs> Nobody's been able to do that. So, 
It took us two and a half years. It took us a year to do the research and two and a half years to get the paper published because we leapfrogged a lot of other people. So can we do it with human hearts? Well, this is a decellularized pig heart in a bioreactor with two to three billion human cells. And you can see what it looked like on the left and what it looks like on the right trying to beat against a blood pressure. And you can see it's squeezing some, but it's not great. And sorry, that was a video taken with my iPhone. You know, so it's the Blair Witch Project iPhone video. Um, but we actually made a lot of progress, but I learned something. I now live in Houston, and before I lived in Houston, I lived in Minnesota. In Minnesota, it's cold and dry. In Houston, it's not. <laughs> um, we've had infection that we have to control for every one of these because that's a, that's a huge issue that we never faced before because of the damp, wet pro, uh, environment. So we said, uh, one of my, my mantras is give nature the tools and get out of the way. In other words, we're not going to figure every detail of this out. And if we do, we'll spend the next 20 years doing that. So we said, let's take one of these hearts. I'm almost finished. Let's transplant it in an animal. So we took a pig heart. We transplanted it in an animal next to the existing heart, heterotopically. So a heterotopic transplant, let's see if we can get it to work. So here's kind of the image of what it looked like. We transplanted it next to, and here's what it looked like when we took it out. Pretty cool. Nature's doing a lot of the work for us. So there's some hurdles. We've got a lot to do yet. We're not there. We need a lot of cells. We need matrix sources. We've got, we've got to build hearts that can last forever. There's a, there's a lot of science in the way. But there are a lot of other hurdles. One is it's very expensive. And that brings me back to other things I've had to learn. I've had to learn how to ask for what I need and what I deserve. I even cringe saying what I deserve up here. You know, it's hard as a woman to negotiate. And these are just some points that I've learned over the years and that I've seen in other research. This is research done by Cancer Research UK. Women adopt male characteristics to get ahead in the workplace, but are still reluctant to push for promotions. One in five believe gender discrimination makes it difficult to reach goals. One of the universities where I was a faculty member did a survey. They did a survey of women. They said, have you ever experienced sexual harassment? 90 plus percent of the women, or has anyone you know? 90 plus percent of the women said yes. Then they asked the men, how many women do you know have experienced sexual harassment? Less than 5% of the men said yes. Perception. So many lack self-confidence. There's lack of flexible childcare support. We make less in part because we negotiate poorly at the start. Negotiation. A lot of women think it's personal. I go in and I ask for a raise and I think it's about me and about how well I'm doing or what I'm doing. The men I'm negotiating with think it's a game. Who's gonna win this negotiation, this battle, this strategy? Almost every man I've ever asked has read The Art of War. And the chapter they point to reliably as the one that's been the most influential to them is strategy in battle. Negotiation is a game to them. Think about it. Guys you know can bat heads with each other and go out and have a beer afterwards. If I had a disagreement with one of you, I would be uncomfortable the next time I saw you. <laughs> Get over it. Here's learn from others. You'll have to be smarter, faster, better, but as Ann Richards and others have said, fortunately it isn't that hard. This is a card I do keep in my office now. It says, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Mahatma Gandhi. It won't always be easy, you won't always be given credit, and you won't always get what you deserve, but you sure won't if you don't ask. 
So figure out why you do it, what motivates you each day, and make more of that. I love this, so I'm going to show it to you. So an English professor wrote the words, a woman without her man is nothing, on the chalkboard, and he asked his students to punctuate it correctly. All the males in the class wrote, a woman without her man is nothing. All the females in the class wrote, a woman without her man is nothing. Again, perception. So join your colleagues, become a mentor, thank the people who help you, speak up for those who can't, form a network that supports you, listen to what the guys are saying even when it sounds like nothing. I had a friend, when I was at Duke, I had a friend who interpreted every faculty meeting for me. We'd go have coffee after and I'd say, I know what I heard, you tell me what I didn't hear. And he did, and it made a huge difference. Because he could tell me about the nonverbal things that the guys said to each other that I didn't know anything about, because he was often in those meetings that happened in the bathroom or the golf course or whatever. So he could give me a lot of information. Read when you can, laugh a lot, the best, re you know, in my opinion, Harvard Business Review makes some great books that you can consider reading. And the best, one of the funniest books I've ever read is Let's Pretend This Never, Re never Happened. I got to tell you, I've never, I laughed out loud on a plane. But most of all, have fun. You spend as much time at work as you do at home. So enjoy it. And if you do, you can do really cool things, like we got to do a flash mob for Stephen Hawking. <laughs> because then you can do amazing things. You can build a heart in a lab, and you can win. So I'll stop there and thank the people in my group. Thank you very much. took a lot of time. Yeah, well. Oh yeah, my mom said never cross your legs in public. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? No? Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so, um, so we're going to do some Q&A and I'm going to start and ask Doris a couple of questions. Um, and then we're going to have microphones um, around. So raise your hand if you want to, to ask her a question. But first, that was fabulous. That Thanks, was fabulous. Um, so I know that you're involved with a lot of different organizations in the country. And, 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 and so tell me how important that is to be involved with different organizations. And I, I certainly have learned a lot from my colleagues and couldn't have done that if I hadn't been involved. You know, I, I remember when I was at Duke, there was a, a woman who got tenure in the Department of Medicine and I called her and I, her name was Peggy uh, Vance and I called her and I said, Peggy, how did you get tenure? I want to be the second person to get, second woman to get tenure in the Department of Medicine and she said, I had an advocate who spoke up for me. Well, I haven't always, I haven't for the most of my career had an advocate, but I have had colleagues and friends that I've made in organizations like sit, did, sitting on study sections for the National Institutes of Health or uh, going to, uh, I sit on the outreach committee for the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy and participating in commit, uh, of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, if you go to those meetings, you can see the state of the art. Review papers. I always review papers because that's how you know in advance what's happening in your field before it comes out. And um, at the same time, if, when you do that, you're often going to be one of two women in the room. And you just have to learn that if you don't hear the B word at least once at every meeting you go to, you're probably not having an impact. 
So um, it, it, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, professional organizations, um, join the committees. I have not always been good at that, and I think it's one of the reasons that some of my career took longer than I wanted it to. So did you find, I mean, did you have mentors along the way? Women, men? I, I had a colleague, again, at Duke. I've never had a mentor. Um, I wish I had. I, I'll give you an example. I went to where a mentor would have made a huge difference in my life. I moved to the Midwest, to the University of Minnesota. I didn't do my homework. I, 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 the University of Minnesota is great, okay, fabulous. But I didn't do my homework, and I didn't understand the culture when I walked in. So I walked into the Midwest Scandinavian culture where Minnesota is a populous state. It's a populist state. It means everyone, you know, when Garrison Keillor says we're all slightly above average, he means it. Everyone is, um, it's a grassroots state. And I walked in, first week I gave a lecture and I said, we're not ahead, but that's okay. We'll just be best and beat the bastards. Everyone in the room's mouth fell open. They were appalled. First of all, I had said a bad word. <laughs> Second of all, we don't try to be best. We try to bring everyone up to the level where we are. It impacted the rest of my career there because I didn't know the culture. So mentors make a huge difference. Most women don't have good mentors who can help them navigate tenure, um, balance, all of those things. I would strongly encourage you to find a male or female you admire, and if not officially, ask them if unofficially, they'll sit down and give you guidance. Everyone wants to help. They really do. They just don't know how to help you. But everyone has an opinion, and they're willing to share it, usually. So go ask. And then, Doris, as we've got to know each other, you have an interesting upbringing. And, and I think it influenced what you yeah. do in life. Yeah, so it does. If, do you mind sharing a little bit of that? So, so I'm a twin. I was, um, I was raised, so... So a couple of things. I'm a twin. My twin brother and I weren't supposed to live when we were born. And he had cerebral palsy to some degree. Not, but he was, he's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, functioned in the world, but I spent a lot of my life protecting him, taking care of him. And then when we got to be about, and, and, then when we were six, my dad died of cancer. Well, nobody in, should go through that as a six-year-old. Um, we moved from Europe, where we were living at the time, to Mississippi. Because my mom's sisters lived in Mississippi. So I was raised in Mississippi. I'm proud of coming from Mississippi. I was raised in Mississippi. I stayed there till I was 20, 21. I went to college. I went to Mississippi University for Women. Um, and where I got to give the commencement speech last May, not that I'm happy or anything about that. It was a real honor. Um, at any rate, first public women's university, last public women's university in the country. Um, but I was raised in Mississippi. And I was raised in Mississippi at a time when change was happening. And so I learned, one, that I could stand up and protect my brother, and two, that you could make a difference in the world because there were some strong, powerful people kicking in Mississippi at that time. And, and you know, my mother, I remember I was playing outside 
on the sidewalk. I was playing hopscotch and my mom came outside and she said, they just passed a law in this land. I was a little kid and she said, it means everybody's the same. I never want to see you treat anyone like they're not the same. I got to see people change the world and it made me realize we could and I'm having a good time trying to do that now and I, I know you all are the future of changing the world so please, please go for your dreams and go for what you believe in and realize you can do it. In fact, we all change the world every day. The question is whether we do it for the positive or negative. We change the world of the people around us every time we interact with them. Thank you for sharing this. So, um, okay, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience and Margaret's over here with the microphone, so. Somebody asked one question well, anyway so that I don't feel uh, <laughs> like I did a miserable job. Thank you very much. Hi, very nice speech today. I'm curious about negotiation. So there's you know, this talk that a lot of the gap between male and female salaries has to do with the fact that women don't negotiate as well. But recent uh, studies have also found that when women do negotiate, they're viewed more negatively than men who negotiate. So it's a double-edged sword, and I'm wondering like, how we're going to get past that, how women are expected to successfully negotiate and do it in a way that isn't seen as threatening, and if you have any suggestions. I guess the first point I would make is if you think you're going to spend your career not being viewed negatively, then you might as well quit now. Because it won't matter if it's negotiation or, or whatever it is, somebody's gonna call you, a be, you know, the B word at some point in your career. I can almost promise you that. So, but that being said, I do now have a mentor, Jim Willerson who I adore, and he was the former editor of Circulation. He's um, president of Texas Heart Institute and, and used to be president of the University of Texas. And he's a very well-known and very powerful man. I've never seen him raise his voice. I have seen him make it very abundantly clear that he wants something from you and he wants it now. But I have never seen him raise his voice. I've seen him be reasonable throughout things and tell people, now you know I need this. Um, and he'll apologize. We were on a phone call this week and we were, we, were we were trying to get a certain outcome. And somebody at a national level disagreed with us. And I heard him say, respectfully, I disagree. And then went on to state his case. And, it, and at the end, he said, I apologize for taking a completely different perspective, but I really think I'm right. And it would never have occurred to me to put my disagreement in that context. He did it without ever raising his voice. I would say, have the data, go in and make your case, find out what motivates your, the, uh, the person on the other side of the table. Is it, is it really a game for them or is it budget? Um, and when it's time to stop, you'll know from the look on the other person's face, but you know, state your case, have the data, and do it in a professional way. They want you to be emotional. Then it's easy to call you difficult. So, um, no, 
No. I actually think sometimes it's more difficult to get funding for cutting edge ideas. Um, first of all, NIH isn't going to support them. They don't want me as a woman. I, I think my success has been based on the fact that I'm one of these people who likes to synthesize ideas. And I believe science is about, uh, it's what I call the Renaissance approach to science. You ask a question and go find whatever it takes to answer it. You don't uh, have a technique in search of a question. You have a question in search of an answer. Um, I certainly think that I, I really lay, attribute a lot of my success to the fact that when we made breakthroughs, they were recognized as breakthroughs by my university, by, my, by the media, and by the world, and therefore people learned my name. What you want for most of your career is you want to stay under the radar except when you want to be on it. And you want to be able to decide when you're on it. Um, and you want your mentor, you want people, your, you want your boss, you want whoever to think of you when there are opportunities and not think of you otherwise, for the most part. Um, as a woman, I think not being afraid to speak up has been important for me. It hasn't always been positive, but it's been important. You mentioned Dr. Willerson. So a few years ago, he came and did a program for Missouri Cures. And what a gentle, I mean, you know, he's kind of small. And he had his cowboy boots on. And he walked up here and said, no PowerPoints, no nothing. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. But yeah, what a, an amazing guy. Um, so Doris, what do you think was like your biggest challenge that you faced in your career and maybe your biggest opportunity? My biggest challenge is lack of self-confidence. You know, really, um, I know <laughs> from the time I was a postdoc to, to last week, I've had moments where I say, oh crap, if I lose my job, what else am I qualified to do? Nothing, <laughs> you know? Um, and friends used to talk, friends and I used to talk about, well, if you can do science, you can cook, so maybe we can open a restaurant, <laughs> you know? So biggest challenge is lack of self-confidence. Um, biggest opportunity, learning to listen. How did you find your passion on building a heart? You know, I wanted to be a neurobiologist, and I ended up, I didn't plan my career. I wanted to be a neurobiologist. And when I was in graduate school, the department chairman said, we're doing molecular biology, and neurobiology doesn't have enough molecular biology in it for you to be in that field, get out of that field now. So the closest I got was um, to nerve cells in a dish with heart cells. And then I, then I went to New York to do a molecular biology postdoc, and I remember my, my, I was at Einstein, and my mentor at the time, my boss, said, you know heart cells never divide. That once you're born, your heart gets bigger because the cells get bigger, not because they divide. And we, we're going to try to figure out how to make heart cells divide. And I thought, oh my god, that sounds like signaling, and that sounds so boring. <laughs> so then I said, well, maybe we can figure out how to put new cells in and make them work. And so we went from doing gene therapy to doing cell therapy. And along the way, 
We realized that cell therapy wasn't enough for people with thinned out leathery scarred up hearts. And so we said, wouldn't it be cool if we could take the cells out and put new cells back in? And that's how it happened. You know, don't be afraid to take tangents because they may just be your real path. Thank you. I'm Kelly Moley at Washington University. I'm a senior physician scientist also. And um, I, I hear what you're saying about always having to sort of watch your back with the men. But I'm finding as I get higher up in organizations that I actually have to fight against the women. And, we, and even though you're right, we're all trying to help, there are certain women who are not of the same mindset. How do you deal with those women? Right. I don't know if you, I, I didn't emphasize it, but the slide where the study was done in the UK, the first point in that slide was a lot of women who succeed think they have to act like men once they succeed. And, and I'm not men bashing here, I'm really not. I, I, it re, there's really just a different form of communication that I as a woman take personally when it comes from another person and most of my male colleagues don't. They take it as, an, as a strategy and as a, we can knock heads with each other all day long. But there, but there are some negatives, obviously, when a woman does the same thing. Female colleagues who have been hard for me to deal with, um, I either have realized or have been disempowered themselves are angry or have no idea how to do it differently. So I try to usually ask them what's really going on here. What's the bottom line here? What is it you really want? What is it you really aren't getting that you need? And then I usually hear a whole list of litany of things and try to get at the root of that. And sometimes I've been successful and sometimes I haven't and then I have to, uh, what I found in those situations is I have to choose my message and stick to it and say, you can't speak like that to me. You, you I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to let someone beat me up over this or, you know, I remember, I, I don't, I'm, I can't believe I'm going to share this. Um, <laughs> I was in a personal relationship at one point in my life when I was young where I was involved with someone who was physically inappropriate, inappropriate towards me. And I remember having to learn to say, you cannot do that. If you do that, I'm going to leave. And having to, do, having to leave. And, and I go back to that and how the only thing that saved me was knowing my message, saying my message over and over, saying what the bottom line was, and then living with it. And that's what I have to say to people when they're inappropriate, no matter who it is. No, you can't, you can't speak to me that way. No, you can't act that way. That's not, we don't do that that way here. I loved your remarks. I'm a, a mom, and I have two grown children, thank goodness, but I worked throughout their um, growing up, and I just wonder if you could give advice, because there's a lot of young mom, uh, women here who might become moms, and it was, a, it was a tricky, tricky. It is tricky. It's tricky. It's tricky as a as a mom, it's tricky as a spouse, it's tricky as a, as a faculty or member or business person, all of it's tricky. And Nature published a, a paper 15 years ago now saying women work on average 30 hours more a week than men. I don't know about you all, but that doesn't surprise me because we're constantly working at something. The good news is we have brains that let us multitask, <laughs> whereas they have brains that let them do what I call refrigerator blindness. Where's the mustard? It's on the front shelf. 
No, it's not. It's not here. It's on the left on the shelf. Come open the door. It's on the left on the shelf. <laughs> so the good news is we can multitask, the, but the, rea the reality is you have to form a network to help you as you develop your career and your family and whatever. Nobody can do it alone. And the people who try are the people who burn themselves out or don't feel successful or don't accomplish everything that they think they should accomplish. So get support, admit, you know, if you can't be at a meeting, I can't be at a meeting, but I'm counting on you to tell me what I missed and help me out. Will you do that for me? Um, and find people who've got your back, personally and professionally. Don't be afraid to admit when you can't do it all. Because you'll think, I, I, I meant it when I said, do what you love and hire to your weakness. Don't be afraid. I've, I've wanted to start a business called Wives for Working Women. <laughs> I, I think, I, I, you know, really a concierge service that just does all the things that, that we have to do but wish we didn't have to do so we could do the things we want to do, like go to a soccer game or go to whatever. It's about priorities, but it's also about recognizing that, the, that you have to be your priority and whatever decision you make is okay. Yes. And I'll tell you, the reason for my question, like shaping my question, is because I'm a mom of a son of type 1 diabetes. Yes. And there's been a lot of research coming out, stem cell therapy research mm -hmm. coming out in the last couple of years about this. I'm curious about your thoughts of using stem cell therapy versus transplant therapy, like what you're talking about for autoimmune conditions. And what, where is the Right. So, so diabetes, like a lot of other diseases, is an inflammatory disease, right? And it's about the islets being destroyed. There are data in animals from a number of years ago that if you give any very potent anti-inflammatory agents, islets can re re reproduce. Many, many, many individuals who get type 1 diabetes get it after an illness of some sort, um, like the flu. I personally think islet cell transplant um, and mesenchymal cell tra transplant to alter the immune state is very promising. Very promising. Transplant, where I have collaborated with some folks in Wisconsin, taught them how to decellularize pancreas. They're working to rebuild pancreas with uh, using our decellularization techniques. It will happen. The question is when. I also think there's some very promising data coming out. Um, on new islet cell transplant methods. I'm, I, I, I think that's one of the areas where regenerative medicine is probably going to have one of the larger, that and orthopedics have the larger impact early. I believe it's a Th1, Th2 balance and that um, mesenchymal cells and other cells like them that can alter the immune status really are very promising. I'd be happy, uh, you can email me if you want to, I'd be happy to talk to you about it offline. Well, I, I'm going to wrap it up with one last question about regenerative medicine. 
because it just really seems to you know, be the wave of the future. And, and we, we are both on the board of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine and Washington University just started their Center for Regenerative Medicine. And I know University of Missouri would love to have a Center for Regenerative Medicine. All these things take money. But so can you kind of talk about that a little bit? I think regenerative medicine is really about capturing the essence of what is health, what is disease, and how do we move you between the two. And it's capturing the endogenous repair processes. You know, about eight years ago, I said, you know, in 10 years, we won't be talking about cell therapy. We'll be talking about how to alter the immune state and how to alter inflammation and what are the things that cells secrete. When you do cell therapy, about less than 20% of the cells remain. So everyone says the cells have a paracrine effect, a secretory effect. It's really about harnessing those endogenous processes. And it is the future because as we age, uh, as the population ages, I don't think any of us want to build ways to live forever, but we want to build ways to live healthily for as long as we live. We want to build, we want to create processes where you can live like this and then drop. You know, <laughs> and I think um, financially it's got to happen. I think uh, the healthcare system is clearly overburdened if we don't learn how to do that and inter uh, intervene in some of these processes. It's not going to matter because we're not going to be able to afford to treat people. So. I, I have every confidence. Science is about the next generation ideas, and translation is about implementing those ideas, filtering and implementing those ideas. And it's new methods, new, new products, new, uh, I think, smart devices, um, smart cells, smart uh, personalized therapies, smart therapies. And then we were talking about the reimbursement piece. Oh this yeah, morning. I think the biggest, I think what's missing, so right now to move anything forward you have to go through the FDA and we're basically asking low-level government employees to approve new medicines who are putting their careers at risk if they say yes and it turns out to be dangerous. And then trials cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. What Japan has just done, which I think is very smart, is an expedited, uh, it's not really approval, but it's called approval process, where as soon as you do phase one and show safety of a new technology, you can get reimbursement for that while you're doing phase two and phase three. If we let government employees off the hook and could get that done, I think trials for new technologies that are safe would move forward much more rapidly and we'd get the winners and losers out of the field. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Taylor. <laughs>